northwestern provinces of the Roman Empire were littered with a broad array of abandoned or reutilized stone buildings during the post-Roman and medieval periods. The history of many of these buildings during the period following the end of formal occupation is very difficult to work out. Their post-Roman sequences and the experience of abandonment are severely neglected in favor of reconstructing occupation trajectories and the transformation of these structures. And their meaning and place in the landscape to the population of the medieval world is very little studied. This paper is going to look at the concept of abandonment and examine what these buildings meant to people in the early medieval period and then again in the high middle ages and demonstrate that every building had a unique post-abandonment history influenced significantly by local, environmental and human factors. It's going to address or try to address stone robbing as a catch-all term for any robbing or any post-Roman activity at these sites. And I picked... Uh, wrong one. I picked this out of a general history book that I had as a child um, that really influenced my views on post-Roman, what happened in the early medieval world. And it's very poorly drawn and um, it's a bad photo, but um, it was the best I could do. Abandonment in the Roman world is traditionally viewed as a separate phase to reuse and transformation. Um, he tends to lump both different types of activities together as a single form of abandonment. In this framework, it's been defined as the singular process by which an entire place is transferred to the archaeological record. Um, e. Schiffer um, tends to view it as a direct process of site formation and that abandonment is the end of all meaningful use at a site. However, it's never this straightforward. He, he discounted everything from stone robbing to sheltering to reusing the site in any any form whatsoever. It's rarely as black and white, and as this is my definition, the end of formal permanent occupation at a site or sector of a site um, demonstrates that it is a stage process of many competing trajectories. And it gives this gives scope for catastrophic site abandonment to more gradual stages of desertion or um, multiple trajectories going on at the same time. Within this definition, the paper assumes three types of abandonment based on frequency and density of use. Seasonal, episodic, and permanent. Of course, permanent abandonment is very rare in that a site must be almost completely destroyed for no form of reuse to go on whatsoever. Uh, some recent work has been done on this, but very little of it in the Western Empire. Um, there's been some looking at the Principia at York, where there is a good strate stratigraphy of post-Roman occupation, and we have lots of evidence that these buildings are being used by the medieval, the populations of medieval Britain and Western Europe, although mostly from site reports in southwest Somerset. Um, Tim Eaton looked at the reuse of Roman stonework in medieval Britain, but primarily in churches, and Frey looked at spolia, but also in Mediterranean fortifications. So there's been very little done about any uh, reuse at sites and what they meant. This paper is going to briefly look at the perceptions and legacies in the early medieval period, so roughly between the 5th and 11th centuries, and the high medieval period between the 11th and the 14th, give or take. Um, it's going to look at the changes in the perception of these buildings over time, concentrating on easily accessible material in Britain, um, whilst looking at the roles played by these buildings during the past, specifically the paradox inherent in the two generalised perceptions of the Roman past. At the centre of the legacy is this paradox between Roman buildings that acted as a focus for symbolic occupation or symbolic behaviour and as a ready source of practical resource acquisition through the recovery of building materials and objects. This relationship is most acute during the early medieval period. Abandoned Roman structures were physically at their densest in the landscape and acted as powerful focal attractors for symbolic behaviour, with legends and myths and superstitions de developing around them in the early centuries after the end of Roman rule. The fear or, of ruined buildings is a deep, runs deep within the, uh, the physical and uh, literary evidence. Um, the earliest one I could find was Pliny, which is reused in a very nice passage from St Germanus in the 5th century about the sanctification of a ruined Roman building in Gaul. Um, this evidence takes a number of forms, um, archaeological material from the northwestern provinces, um, the development of early Christian medieval sites, and the reuse, but not exclusively rural, um, of buildings across the Western Empire, often presaged by rural cemeteries, such as Morkan or Tholi or Ebenamal. 
religious reoccupation of the sites may represent something of the concept of cleansing them of pagan demons and superstitions, advertising to local populations the power of the church. Combined with this, it may also represent a conscious attempt to reoccupy seats of secular power and to associate the church with the power of the Roman builders and the, uh, the prestige of history. That is a, an undetermined Roman building that had a church built on it in the 7th century in Canterbury and then reuse of the villa at Orpington and Southwell were both reused for large post-Roman cemeteries that lasted in one case until the 9th century. The symbolic attraction of Roman buildings is echoed in the literature. Germanic and specifically Saxon sources repeatedly refer to Roman ruins as the work of giants. Legends develop around them, for example, the links between Arthur and Caerlon, or the already mentioned life of St Germanus. The, this impression of an invented symbolic past onto these objects suggests a deep, non-functional engagement with Roman buildings. The symbolic interaction with these sites, instilling them with elements of mythologized past, suggests they had a strong legacy on the social landscape after the end of formal occupation, and a sense of reverence is implied. The repeated evidence from a vast range of sites of Saxon, Gothic, and Merovingian occupation suggests that post-Roman immigrant populations, probably of highly mixed ethnic origin, origins, were attempting to associate themselves with Roman sites for purposes of power and the development of new social hierarchies, establishing hierarchy in the only understood way through the medium of Roman buildings. This may be seen in the repeated evidence of seasonal reuse for buildings for feasting, especially from groups of villas in the Low Spelt in Northern Gaul, and most famously from the small pig horizon at York Minster. Despite this evidence for deeper association of these sites... Oh, I'm so sorry. What happened there? Computer. Despite the evidence of deep associations with these sites, much of the hard archaeological evidence indicates that local populations were interacting with these structures in different ways. Stone recovery, material dumping, looters' pits, rubbish dips indicates that other processes were ongoing, especially in rural areas. Such forms of practical use of these buildings were undertaken in the early medieval period, and evidence of the recovery from stone from Roman buildings drastically increases after the 6th century, when stone-built churches begin to be constructed again. This indicates that practical reuse for abandoned buildings and the use of their fabric for reuse and recycling may have taken priority over symbolic behaviour. The need for building materials, or more material requirements and desires for looting through dumping activity, may have been an important driver across many sites and indicate that the literary sources no doubt exaggerate some of the elements of superstition with regard to these structures. <clears throat> Towards the end of the early period, um, the perception of these buildings begins to change. Roman structures are increasingly viewed in a practical sense as stone sources for both major construction projects such as castles and cathedrals and for more domestic renovations within towns and cities. Increasing evidence of stone recovery and dumping at all classes of sites is evident much of it dating between the 11th and the 14th century. The increasing scale and scope of this recovery indicates that buildings were being stripped in a more organised sense, especially in the old Roman towns. Evidence of stripping in this sense is archaeologically difficult to discern, although it's no coincidence that cathedrals, especially in their earlier forms, in large Roman settlements such as York, Cologne and Lincoln, used the largest public, Roman public buildings as foundations. Literary evidence does actually exist for this. There is um, some legal evidence from 11th century Peterborough which makes a distinction between newly quarried stone and wall stain, um, or Roman rubble, or it's generally interpreted as Roman rubble. And um, Matthew of Paris records the dis demolition of Verulanium, uh, modern day St Albans, to make the cathedral uh, in the 11th century. The changing perception of these buildings coincides with this great cathedral building period and certainly influences the beginning of a change in attitude towards Roman ruins. There, the Tower of Verulania, of St Albans Abbey, made almost completely with Roman material from um, Verulania, just across the pond. Um, towards the, despite this, there's some evidence of the continuing influence that Roman buildings played on the landscape. Archaeological evidence exists that suggests that some sites were deliberately demolished for reasons other than stone recovery, through the presence of strategically placed pits and trenches undermining the structural underpinnings of buildings. The primary example of this is 
Tetrapylon and Le legionary battlehouse at Caerlon in Wales. These buildings had long been associated with Arthurian legends and had a perceived importance to the people of South Wales and acted in some respect as a focal point to Welsh resistance to the March of Lords. The archaeology suggests that these two standing buildings underwent a particularly intensive period of demolition between 1240 and 1260, into which much of the material was not recovered for further use and there is some evidence of lime kilns to burn or break down the material into rubble. These large buildings could not have been pulled down without a centralised authority, with sufficient will to make an ultimately unfruitful enterprise. Such deliberate destruction would have required drafts and levies of labour, especially for large buildings such as Caerlon or St Albans, and could not be undertaken at a moment's notice or on a whim. Forward planning was required, and certainly an investment of time and labour. For example, the demolition of the internal buildings at Inch Toothal was uh, estimated to have taken 230,000 man-hours. And it's worth noting that medieval operations could not have had that level of efficiency. This relationship with the large Roman buildings is reinforced by Corbridge, Roman Coria, where repeated stone recovery phases ending in the 11th century seem to have deliberately targeted public buildings of the town to build a series of churches at Hexham Abbey, despite domestic and industrial structures being closer to Hexham. A conscious decision here was made to reuse stone from the monumental public buildings in the centre of the old town. These examples certainly demonstrate that the Roman, the Roman public buildings still displayed an outward sense of prestige and um, power in well into the medieval period, both in terms of symbolic relationships with local populations, in some cases developing an invented mythology, a past, mythological past around them, and in terms of a practical connection with large-scale stone stripping. Um, this paper is intended to draw some of the perceptions and legacy, and I try to be very quick. Um, due to the time considerations, which I think I might have been very on top of. Um, however, what can actually be concluded from something like this? Um, at the beginning I said there was going to be more to these buildings than simple stone robbing. Um, so firstly, the afterlife of these buildings is greatly influenced by the paradox inherent in their perception, an emulation versus stone recovery. This paradox is certainly influenced by the role played by these buildings after their abandonment to a great degree. In the earlier period, it's much more common for the boundary to be blurred. Symbolic activities and practical activities could exist at the same time on the same site. The destruction of sites during the medieval period is also worth noting. It tends to come in two forms, deliberate destruction or simple stone robbing. Deliberate destruction could only be undertaken by high, higher organisational powers, essentially some arm of the state. Uh, only in the large occupied towns, such as York or Cun, there is evidence of small-scale continuous destruction or levelling of Roman buildings for the expansion of timber or stone constructions. Generally, deliberate uh, destruction and more casual stone robbing have been lumped together as a single process, and al although there are significant overlaps, applying the moniker robber trench to any or all post-Roman features on a site is unhelpful. Rather than this very basic analysis, nuances must be teased out in the record and a line drawn between deliberate demolitions for purposes other than stone robbing and stone quarrying from ruined or partially ruined buildings. It's not appropriate to label all features as the products of stone robbers, but rather look at them in a more holistic way, questioning why some sites have suffered deliberate and systematic destruction and why some appear to be left or standing and plundered, although it must be noted that many sites have been that uh, were deliberately demolished, may have had their surviving materials carted off or reuse anyway. The final key point to stress is that abandonment of Roman buildings and the subsequent medieval interaction with these buildings is highly fragmented, with a single abandoned building acting in different parts, in different multiple trajectories from multiple individual experiences. A building could act as a shelter to one person while still serving as a source of ready stone to someone else and possibly the same to the same person. Um, buildings could serve as shelters, sources of stone and rubbish tips. And I will end on um, something said by Matthew of Paris on the de demolition of Verulanium, describing the fires lit by some of the workforce whilst they were clearing these houses. Mm -hmm. And I think very, very well this illustrates the changing use of a building within the same period at the same time. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope that was okay. okay.